Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Diane Baden, a member of the ELECT's Continuing Education Committee. We are pleased to present this webinar in our series on RDA, Resource Description and Access. Our presenter is Adam Schiff, Principal Cataloger at the University of Washington Libraries, Seattle, Washington. Adam served as chair of one of the two RDA examples groups that supplied all of the examples found in RDA. And he has given numerous presentations on the differences between AACR2 and RDA. During the webinar, if you have questions for Adam, please type them into the question box on your screen. Adam will leave time at the end to respond to as many questions as possible. Please note that we are recording the webinar and you will receive an email with a copy of the slides and a link to the recording. Please note that the ELECT's office is closed due to the snow in Chicago and that you will probably receive the recording by Friday of this week. And now I will turn the program over to Adam. There will be a slight pause as we change presenters. Thank you, Diane. Can everyone hear me? Um, I'm glad to see so many people were able to make it, um, even with the snow in the Midwest and East of uh, the U.S. and Canada. This is just a screenshot to show a few years back when I was busy working on the RDA examples. Um, my desk hasn't gotten much neater since then, unfortunately. This presentation was originally prepared for a pre-conference session of the 2010 British Columbia Library Conference um, back uh, in April of last year. And um, it proved to be so popular that I've managed to be invited to a whole bunch of different places to give it. And um, I do want to thank Judith Kuhagen of the Library of Congress who helped review the original draft and uh, made some suggestions for improving it clarified a number of misunderstandings that I had, and also loaned me a few slides that they were using for training at LC um, that were prepared for the US RDA test. Um, now, because of time constraints, this webinar is actually an abridged version of a more comprehensive um, presentation. Uh, we have a different expression that you can get on my website um, at this URL. Um, and I've had to actually cut uh, a fair amount of content from that original British Columbia presentation as well. So you can get the full content um, online. I worked from a list of changes compiled by the Joint Steering Committee and posted on its website. And I want to note that this is not necessarily a complete list. It's just those that were identified during the RDA development test. And um, the presentation does not cover all of the changes from AACR2 to RDA, nor does it include most of the new instructions that are unique to RDA. Um, nor many of the new Mark 21 bibliographic and authority format additions and changes made for RDA, although I will cover some of those today and some of them next week when we talk about access points. Um, I've selected the changes from AACR2 to RDA that I thought would be of most interest to a general audience. So if you're a law cataloger interested in treaties, you won't see anything in this presentation about treaties, and there are changes to how treaties are, to, are, are done in RDA. So I've given you on the screen, um, and don't bother to write this down, you'll get a copy, um, the major URLs for these changes um, for both R ACR2 to RDA from the JSC, um, Mark 21 changes, and also for those of you that use OCLC, um, their technical bulletin 258 um, lists all of the Mark changes that they implemented back in May of 2010. 
just a little bit about identifying RDA records. The RDA test is now over, and the, the records that were produced during that are actually available for viewing. Um, and you can go to the RDA test website to view that. But if, if we're talking about Mark 21 bibliographic records, you can identify RDA records by the presence in the 040 subfield E of the value RDA. Subfield E is the descriptive cataloging um, um, code that's being used. And also, in leader 18, there's a change from AACR2. And you might see a variety of things in that. It will be coded I if the ISBD punctuation is included, or blank if ISBD punctuation is not followed. Or there's a new code, C, that was recently defined for ISBD punctuation followed, except that ISBD punctuation is not present at the end of a subfield. Now, of course, um, what was in this before for ASCR2 was the value A. Just a couple of screenshots to show you some RDA records. This one comes from the LC catalog, the online catalog, and you can see in the 040 the presence of the subfield E RDA telling us this is an RDA record, and also in the very cryptic leader, which is imp really impossible to read in this um, display, there's that I that tells us that, else, that this record is using ISBD punctuation. If you're looking at an OCLC record, um, you've got basically the same thing. We've got a, uh, the O4O subfield E RDA, and then this leader is displayed with the, the caption description that tells you what the descriptive um, display is going to look like. OCLC has a web page describing its policies for creating original RDA records and for upgrading or converting records to RDA at this address. And these protocols were set um, to apply until the evaluation of the RDA test is released uh, later this spring or early this summer, I suppose, by ALA annual. So now what I want to do is actually um, look through area by area, area, AACR2 area by area, through some of the major changes that I think um, people need to know about. And we'll start with area one. Oh, actually, no, I'm sorry. We have one thing before that. Um, th and this isn't actually a change from AACR2 to RDA. It's a change in the ISBD um, as of the consolidated edition of the ISBD. So, um, RDA is following the ISBD in that each adjacent data element that requires square brackets will now be enclosed in its own set of brackets. So you can see the difference in these examples from ACR2 to RDA. And I'll talk about the second example and the change with SL and SN at a later point. Uh, but just note that the difference in the way we bracket information within the same single field. And now we'll move on to area one, which is the title and the statement of responsibility area. And I picked out the, the things that I think are the most important at this point. Um, in AACR2, inaccuracies are transcribed, follow either by a bracketed SIC, S-I-C, or by uh, the abbreviation I-E, um, which means that is, and then the correction within square brackets. And AACR2 tells us to supply a missing letter or letters in square brackets. But in RDA, inaccuracies are transcribed as they appear on the source of information. And if necessary, a note can be made correcting the inaccuracy, and the title as corrected can be recorded as a variant title if it's considered important for access. So for monographs, this is a change that you'll see here. Um, we had a typo in a record where we would put bracketed sick after the typo in the title. And then we would give the corrected title in a 246 variant title added entry. In RDA, we transcribe the title as found with the typo. No note that it's an there's an inaccuracy in it at all. And then if it's considered important enough for access, we can make a note and or an added entry. In, in this case, of course, we do want to do that to, to get that correct word micromagnetic in there. So we'll use an added entry. Um, with a note that says title should read this. So this is the first thing where we're seeing that RDA really stresses transcription of what you see. There is a, uh, still the option for serials to correct errors. So this is limited to monographs. Um, with serials, because the issues change from issue to issue, um, the bulk of them probably will have the correction, um, the typo corrected. And so we are allowed to transcribe the corrected title and give a note about the typo. 
another change probably doesn't happen all that often, but it's a change in how we transcribe marks of punctuation. Um, in ACR2, we're told that if the title proper as given in the chief source of information includes the punctuation marks dot, 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 or square brackets, that we would replace them by a dash or parentheses, rounded brackets. In RDA, we transcribe punctuation as it appears on the source, omitting punctuation on the source that separates data to be, record, to be recorded as one element from data to be recorded as a different element or as a second or subsequent instance of an element. What that all means is shown in this example. The title appears on the chief source as if elected dot, dot, dot. ACR2 says we can't use the dot, dot, dot because that's reserved punctuation that has another meaning. Um, and so we change that to a dash, which we um, represent usually as two hyphens. Um, but in RDA, we will record the, the ellipse uh, as it appears. Now a little change for serials. For serials in AACR2, if the title includes a date, name, number, etc., that varies from issue to issue, we're told to omit the date, name, number, etc., and replace it by the mark of omission unless it occurs at the beginning of the title, in which case do not give the mark of omission. This is a change from, in, in RDA, we are um, told that if a title of the serial is, includes a date, name, number, etc., that varies, omit this date and use a mark of omission to indicate such omission, and there's nothing about saying don't use that mark of omission at the beginning of the title. So you can see the first two examples on this slide are identical in AACR2 and RDA, but the third one is the one that's different, where the, the, the date appears in the beginning of the title. Um, we would include those ellipses in the RDA transcription. Okay, let's move, move along from the title proper to the GMD. And I'm sure everyone is aware by now that um, we have three new mark fields that are replacing the GMD. So we will no longer be using subfield H um, in field 245, and it is being replaced by three fields. Field 336 for content type, which comes out of RDA 6.9, um, 337 for media type, and 338 for carrier type. Now, there are also, so um, for each of these, um, there's a definition. So content type, we have the form of communication through which a work is expressed. So this is expression level information to begin with. Um, and there is a list in RDA 6.9 of all the various types. Um, some examples would include performed music, text, two-dimensional moving image, um, three-dimensional moving image as well. Um, then for media type, we're talking about the general type of intermediation device required to view, play, run, etc., the content of the resource. So example would be that it's audio, it's computer, it's microform, it's unmediated, it's video. And then we have field 338, which deals with carrier type, which is the format of the storage medium and housing of a carrier. And an example of that would be an audio disc um, or an online resource microfiche, video cassette, volume. Now, people, why, why are we replacing the GMD? Well, it became very hard for one single term to express um, all the ways that materials are being issued now. So you can have electronic um, texts with video, et cetera, and it was very hard to um, use a single GMD or even a combination of GMDs, and the, they um, and developers of RDA really decided to break these up into three things. And these, these are closed vocabularies in RDA developed with the Onyx publishing community. And codes for each term have been established in MARC as well and can be used instead of or in addition to the term. And one of the complaints that people say is that, well, I don't like these terms. What does unmediated mean? What is a user going to do with that? And these terms are not necessarily meant to display in OPACs. You can choose to display them, but it's hoped that maybe they will develop, OPEX will develop to display these in icons, or um, you could turn these terms into some other terms that are more familiar to your own local users. Um, so, or they could possibly be used for filtering or for limiting searches in some way. So, so it's not necessarily meant to just display. And here at the University of Washington, when we um, looked at all the new RDA mark fields, we decided not to actually display any of these three fields in, in our um, public catalog at this point. 
So here's an example of the change showing, a, this is a video recording. So on the left we have um, the title proper followed by the GMD video recording. On the right, um, no more GMD, but that's replaced by the three fields, 336, 337, and 338. And in this particular example, I've shown you um, recording both the term and the mark code for it, as well as the subfield 2, which is used to show what vocabulary these terms came out of. Moving along to parallel titles. Um, in A's here too, we're told to transcribe parallel titles in the order indicated by their sequence on or by the layout of the chief source of information. And by definition, a parallel title in AOCR2 must come from the same source as the title proper. In RDA, we don't have that limitation anymore. RDA defines parallel title as the title proper in another language or, and or script, but there's no restriction on sources for this information. So we're told in RDA to take parallel titles from any source within the resource. So we get a difference here in this example. On the left, we have on the title page only an English title, and on the cover we have both an English title and a Lao title. And so, because that would not be considered an actual parallel title for transcribing in the 245, so we would make a note about that. But in RDA, you can take the parallel titles from anywhere in the resource, and so it would be recorded in your 245 as well as an added entry. Just another parallel title example. In ACR2 1.1 D2, we get instructions on how many parallel titles to record and which ones. And in general, in the, at least in US practice, we follow the Library of Congress, which has uh, told us that we will generally prepare a second level uh, description. And that would be that we would give the first parallel title and any subsequent parallel title that is in English. So here's an example of that. Um, on the left, we have a title that appears on the on the item in four languages English French Russian and Spanish so we give the first according to a second level description we would give the first parallel title in RDA they, there is no such thing as a concept of first level second level or third level description and so we transcribe all of the parallel titles Moving along, um, still in area one, to other title information, and there's a change um, for continuing resources. ACR2 specifies that other title information is only recorded for continuing resources if it is considered to be important, and then it lists three categories where it's always considered to be important. Um, and I've shown two of those categories here on the screen. RDA doesn't have this limitation, although I have to note that in RDA, other title information is not a core element. And I haven't really talked about core elements yet, but a core element is um, in RDA is something that must be present in the record, um, in all records, or in all records in certain cases. So it's sort of like a required element that um, is expected to be used. So other title information is not a core element. So for serials, um, they, it, it act, or even for monographs, actually, the subtitle is not required, although um, I think most people would say, yes, we have to give that. And in fact, for the RDA test, ELSI um, made um, the other title information a core element. There's a case where we supply other title information, and in ACR2 1.1 E6, we're told that if the title proper needs explanation, supply a brief addition as other title information in the language of the title proper. And then in Chapter 12 for, for Continuing Resources, we're told that if the title proper consists solely of the name of a corporate body, conference, etc., to supply a brief addition in the language of the title proper as other title information to explain the title. There's no equivalent to this in RDA because basically it goes um, against that principle of representation of transcribing what is there and not putting other information that isn't there. Um, so you can see the difference in these two, in these three examples where for conference proceedings that only is the title of the name of the conference in ACR2 we would add a subtitle 
with bracketed proceedings. In RDA, we don't do that. If we need to explain that this is proceedings and not the um, program booklet, for example, or publicity or some other type of material, we could give that in a note. The same thing with a program of a film festival or um, selections of an author's writings where the title is just the name of the author. There are a few cases where, that have been carried over from AACR2, however, where we still can supply other title information. And these are for cartographic and moving image resources. So for a cartographic resource, if the title of the resource doesn't really convey the geographic area covered by that map, then we can supply, just as we do in AACR2, a bracketed um, explanation. And the same thing with a, a motion picture, if the title and the doesn't convey that you're not getting the entire motion picture, for example, you can still supply um, a bracketed information that what you have here is just the trailer, for example. Um, I'm going to talk about, you'll, you'll see in the slide in the red that there's something added to the 110 in the RDA, and we'll talk about that as well later on. Statement of responsibility. ACR 21.1A2 says that a statement of responsibility taken from outside the chief source of information must be enclosed in square brackets. In RDA, only a statement of responsibility taken from a source outside the resource itself will be enclosed in square brackets. So you can see the change here. On this item, we have uh, the statement of responsibility on the title page of Verso, in, and in ACR 2, that would need square brackets around it. But in RDA, we don't need to do that. And the rule of three, I'm sure you all know this by now, the rule of three has gone away. In ACR2, of course, if we had four or more um, persons or entities of any kind named in a statement of responsibility, we were told to only record the first one and follow that by the mark of omission and in, then in square brackets at all. So you see the result of that on the left-hand side. In RDA, there is no such um, the rule of three, the basic rule, is not to have the rule of three. So basically, you transcribe all of the statement of responsibility as it appears. So um, we will give all four of these names, and I'm sure Mr. Roseland is quite happy now that his name will show up in our bibliographic records. Um, note there's also one other change here. Notice the indicator value. And that reflects a change in how works are named in RDA. In a um, work in AACR2 that had more than three authors, we entered the work under the title. So we named the work by the title. In RDA, no matter how many authors there are, um, we will name the work by the first named author. So the, in, in the full record for this in RDA, we, there would be a 100 field with an um, access point for Markey. And we'll talk about that again in part two when we talk about access. Now, there isn't still an option in RDA to do an omission, but they don't like Latin in RDA, so they get rid of Latin. And there's the option that says, if you want to omit, um, you can omit all but the first of each group of persons, families, or bodies, and you indicate the omission by summarizing what has been omitted in the language and script preferred by the agency preparing the description. And you indicate that the summary was taken from a source outside the resource, as instructed in a different set of RDA, but what that means is we put it in square brackets in this case. So if the library chose to do an optional omission, it would not be dot, dot, dot at all. It would be bracket and three others. Now, for the test, the, there was an LC policy statement that said, generally do not omit names in a statement of responsibility. Um, but I have seen um, some of the test participants who did RDA records did use this option. And whether you, this is interesting, whether you record or not all the four names and, or whether you give this omission, you still have the choice of whether to give access points for all four of the names. So it's not tied into, as it was in ACER 2, to what's in the statement of responsibility that you record. Another change with statement of responsibility is that in ACER 2, we omitted all those other words titles and, and abbreviations of titles of nobility, address, honor, distinction, initials of society, qualification, et cetera, in statements. There were a few cases where we were told we had to include them, but in generally, we omitted 
um, all those other words surrounding names. And in RDA, we don't have that um, limitation anymore. We transcribe what we see. So you can see the change in this slide where um, we would include the late doctor in the statement of responsibility, or we would include by the reverend R.M. Dickey, not, and we wouldn't drop off the reverend. There is still an optional omission um, in RDA that allows you to abridge a statement of responsibility, um, it, but you can only do it if it can be abridged without essential loss of essential information, and always record. It's told, we're told to always record the first name appearing in the statement, and when omitting names from a statement of responsibility, we apply instructions under another rule. And there was an LC policy statement for this that said generally do not abridge a statement of responsibility. So at, during the test, they, LC catalogers were told not to um, abridge these statements of responsibility. Okay, moving right along to addition statement. In RDA, addition statement is a transcribed element, and no abbreviations are used unless they appear on the source used for the addition statement. Whereas in AACR2, we're told to go to um, Appendix B um, for abbreviations, and uh, Appendix C to record certain types of numerals. And so you can see the changes here from ACR2 to RDA. We go from second edition to spelled out second edition because that's what appears on the source. Um, abbre abbreviation Nouvelle Edition gets spelled out completely. Roman numerals will now be recorded as Roman numerals. But again, in the last example, you can see if you have an abbreviated form that's found on the item, you record that in the abbreviated form. Note on the right of that fourth example, you see that there's a second period, and this is a change in the ISBD that's generated a lot of controversy. I omitted a slide in my fuller, that I have in my fuller presentation, but basically um, we're told that areas, we end areas in periods even when they abbreviate, even when they end in abbreviation. And um, I think there's probably going to be a lot of pressure on the ISBD review group to change this because um, people think it looks really strange. Okay, let's move on to publication, distribution, etc. Um, again, we have abbreviations that we're told to use in ACR2, and in RDA, those abbreviations are not used. So we will record fuller, the full form as found on the item. So we're, we're representing the item as it represents itself. Um, so something that says Vancouver, British Columbia will no longer be Vancouver, BC. It will be Vancouver, British Columbia. And the same thing with other words like department, um, where uh, we will now spell that out. Also, um, we will generally not shorten the um, place of publication or distribution. So if it says Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, we generally would have recorded that in ACR2 as Victoria, BC. We would have dropped off Canada. In RDA, we will record the whole thing. But again, if you have an abbreviation that appears on the item, you will record that abbreviation as found. So the change in this example is that we keep the BC, but since it also says Canada, we will include the Canada in the um, transcription of the place of publication. You see a change in the subfield C as well, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. In ACR2, we're also allowed to supply in brackets some information for explanation. And in RDA, again, we don't do that. We record the places as found. And then if an explanation is needed, it would be given in a note field. So for London, Ontario, not London, England, the cataloger would have put bracket ONT. But in this case, um, in RDA, just record London and then a 500 note. If it's judged to be important enough to, to make a note, you could, it wouldn't be required in RDA that it was published in London, Ontario. Okay, now, um, we've had this way of doing things for recording multiple places depending on the location of the home agency, the cataloging agency. So, and the, so the results would vary in records based on the, the home country of the cataloging agency. RDA is attempting to be more international, and so um, it's attempting to get a result that is more uniformly able to be shared. So let's look at a very simple example. Um, we have a book published um, in Toronto, Buffalo, and London. 
by the University of Toronto Press. In this first example, I've got a record created by a Canadian library in AACR2. So according to ACR2 rules, only Toronto would be given. In RDA, we have two options. RDA just says to give all the places and record them in the order um, that they are indicated by the sequence layout or typography on the source of information used. But only the first named place is actually required in RDA. So you could either get Toronto, Buffalo, London, or Toronto, but you would never get something else in RDA. Now for a US agency, they would have recorded this as Toronto, Buffalo in AACR2. Um, and in RDA, notice that we would add to London or we would just record Toronto. Again, we would get the same result as the Canadian library. And for a British library, again, in AACR2, we get a different result, Toronto, London, but the same result um, in RDA. So this is going to enable us to share records um, more easily and not have to I doubt that many of us have the staff to actually change these in copy, um, but if you're upgrading the record for whatever reason, you might actually do that, and um, we shouldn't need to do that in the future. Okay, now I want to talk about probably the most complicated thing um, in description that, that I think is it's a little bit hard for our people to understand, and it's dealing with publication information. Um, and again, we have to talk about these core concepts. So place of publication, publisher's name, and date of publication are core elements for published resources. That means you must record something for all three of those elements. So when we're talking about date, a date of publication or a probable date of publication or the phrase date of publication not identified must always re be recorded in RDA. Now copyright date is a separate element in RDA and it does not substitute for publication date like it did in ACR2. Copyright date is a core element if neither the date of publication nor the date of distribution is identified. And one other thing is that if more than one place a publication or publisher's name appears on the source of information, only the first is required. So let's look at how that this plays out. Now the key thing is that um, what happens is, is if you don't have something that, uh, if you have no date of publication, then you, that, then you invoke the next level, which means that the distribution information becomes core, and we'll show that in a bit. Um, let's just show some changes between how you record unknown places or unknown publishers in ACR2 and RDA. In ACR2, we use Latin. Um, the writers of RDA completely got rid of Latin in most cases. I, there may, maybe there's some Latin left, but they got rid of most of it. So SL, the abbreviation Sina Loco, gets replaced by place of publication not identified. SN, Sina nom, Nomine, I think, I can't remember what that means, um, gets replaced by publisher not identified. Um, we still can have questionable places, but remember we bracket each individual um, element separately. So you can see that in the third example. And, um, and the fourth example just illustrates an example where you have both SL and SN. Now, place of distribution um, is a core element for a resource in a published form if the place of publication is not identified. So if you don't have place of publication and you do have place of distribution, that becomes required to record. Distributor's name is the same thing. If you don't have the distributor's name, uh, the publisher's name, then if you have the distributor's name, it becomes a core element. And the same thing happens with date of distribution as well. Um, but again, if there's more than one place of distributor, distribution or distributor's name, only the first recorded is required. So here's an example. This is a slide from LC that, that I got um, showing you on the source. It says ABC Publishers 2009, distributed by Iverson Company, Seattle. We don't actually know the place where ABC Publishers is. We only have the place of the distributor. So recording this, um, we would record in subfield A of the 260, place of publication not identified, followed by the um, name of the publisher. And because place of publication has not been identified, that means that place of distribution, if we know it, is core level, a core element, and we have to require, record it. So we record subfield A, Seattle, and then we give the date of, of publication because we know that. What's interesting here is that this example doesn't show the Iverson company, the distributor, and that's because it's not 
required. It is not a core element because we know the name of the publisher. Um, even though it's not a core element, um, I believe that LC has, recommend, has recommended to the testers that they give the full distribution statement because it looks, first of all, it looks very odd and it's useful information um, to have and record. But it's not actually required in RDA, so you could see a record that looks like this. Um, a similar kind of situation in the second example, we have um, the name of the publisher and the place, and we, oh, but no place of publication. And this time we have distributed in Australia by, the, by Goodman. Um, so you get a similar kind of situation, only in this case they bracketed Australia um, because we don't actually have a local place to put. Here's an example showing when the distributor's name has to be recorded. So on the title page we have um, place of publication and a year, but no publisher. On the Verso, we have the name of a distributor and the place of the distributor. And according to RDA, you would record the name of the, the place of the publisher, then you would have to record that publisher is not identified. And because of that, that means that if you know the name of the distributor, it becomes a core element. So we must record the distributor, but because we had the name, the place of the publisher, Evanston is not required by RDA to be recorded. It's not a core element for distribution place in this case. But we end up with a result that looks kind of weird in Mark because RD Distributors is not in Chicago, but it sure looks like it from this 260. And so here's a case again, if we have the further information else is recommending that we include it. I'm going to skip over them. In the interest of time, I'm just going to skip over some of these examples, and you can look at them um, at your leisure. Here's an example of a date of distribution um, where we have the name of the publisher, we have the place of the publisher, but we, and we don't have the name of the, the date of the publication. Now that's a required element, it's core, so we would record that as date of publication not identified, followed by the year of distribution, because when the date of publication is not identified, if you know the date of distribution, it becomes core. Now one of the problems that they're talking about within the MARC community is that um, MARC is not, um, just, you can't record um, this data right now in discrete subfields or in some way to really make it clear that the 2009 recorded in this 260 is the distribution date and not something else. And so there was a discussion paper at Marby at ALA midwinter, and I'm not sure what the results of that are, but they're looking at ways of making it, um, the information about publisher, distribution, and manufacturer very clearly um, indicated in MARC fields and subfields. And that could be creating new, new fields themselves or new subfields or new indicator values. I think those were the three possibilities. I don't know what we'll end up with. There hasn't been an actual proposal yet. It was just in the discussion stage. Manufacturer information works the same way as publication and distribution information. So if you don't have the information about the publisher, then you go to the, to the distribution information. And if you don't have that, then manufacturing information becomes a core element if you have it. Um, Let's talk about dates of publication, distribution, et cetera, and the changes between RDA and AACR2. Um, many cases, they're the same. You can see from the first three examples, there's no difference in how you re would record these dates. But we got rid of Latin. Nobody knows circa, apparently. So um, that's being replaced by 1960, question mark. We're getting rid of the dashes. So that's being replaced by um, a phrase between 1970 and 1979, or with a question mark if the decade is uncertain. And the same thing with century dates. And then you see at the bottom in the last slide, we're getting rid of abbreviations. Um, for unknown dates of publication, the change, uh, we have a few changes. First of all, we will still record copyright dates, but they're considered a separate element from, from uh, in, in RDA. And we record them with the actual copyright symbol, or if you can't reproduce that, with the phrase, with the word copyright spelled out. The same thing with the phonogram. Um, you use the phonogram symbol or um, the word phonogram. And then, of course, if you have no information, you would be recording data production not identified, data publication not identified, etc. Now, here's how that plays out in an actual example. So here we have a book published by UBC Press, and all we have is a copyright date. In ACR2, we can substitute the copyright date for the date of publication. So very simple example. In RDA, 
um, you can record this in a variety of ways, and they're all correct. So we don't know for sure what the date of publication is. So you could record date of publication not identified, and then because of that, copyright date becomes core, and so you record that as copyright 2010. On the other hand, you could guess, you could estimate a date of publication. You could say, well, I know this really was published in 2010, so you could bracket that. And at that point, the copyright date is no longer required. It's not core because you have recorded a date of publication. If you're a little uncertain and you want to hedge your bets, you could add a question mark into that. So you've got three ways, but there's actually two more. You could also, in addition to those last two examples, you could record the copyright date as well. And I believe that LC practice for um, the test was to always give the copyright date if found on the resource. Um, so they would um, record it in, in either one of, in either way um, that you see on this slide. Okay, uh, moving along to extent. Um, in many ways, it's, um, the, the, there aren't a lot of changes to recording extent, but we're getting rid of abbreviations. Um, and there are lists of, there are tables in RDA that tell you which terms to use for what types of resources. And here's an example. So for, for certain types of carriers, there's a list of um, carrier types that would be recorded um, for extents. So if you have an audio disk, you're going to use the phrase audio disk. Um, and so on and so forth. There are a few changes in these terms. Um, and there are also some others not on this slide for microscopic carriers and stereographic carriers. And you also have the option to record other if none of these terms apply. Um, or the word unspecified if you cannot readily be ascertain what it is, what the carrier is. Just like in AES here too, we're allowed to use the term in common usage. Um, so you are allowed in, a, in RDA as well to say one CD instead of one audio disc, or one CD-ROM, one DVD-ROM, or one DVD instead of one video disc. Um, in terms, I've skipped over some slides that I have in the longer presentation you can look at, and I've moved to text. Um, and the main change, of course, is that we're getting rid of abbreviations, so we're no longer going to say P period. You're going to see the words pages spelled out, as you can see at the bottom here. No longer V period, volume will be spelled out. Um, we're getting rid of approximately, um, we, I think it was circa in, in, um, our, in ACR2, and it's being replaced by the fully spelled out word approximately. Um, and we're getting rid of, if we have unnumbered pages, we're not using brackets anymore. We would have said bracket 93. Um, and in this case, we're going to say that the actual number and tell us, tell everyone that it's unnumbered. And here's some examples just showing that when you have a sequence of pages, you still have a variety of ways to do it, but you end up with having to type a lot more. And I think we're going to end up with a lot of typos unless um, people develop ways of inputting this so that we don't have to um, type all of these words out approximately unnumbered. How many records are we going to see with three ends or one end? And we have the same uh, possibilities where you have complicated or irregular paging. Um, again, the main difference is that you're going to give um, spelled out words like pages. But these end up being fairly long um, when you have to spell this all out. Um, and, for, and we can still now record um, one volume various paging instead of that. For dimensions, we're told in RDA to record dimensions in centimeters to the next whole centimeter up and using the metric symbol CM. And what this means that there's a change here in ACR2, CM is an abbreviation always followed by period. Metric symbols do not get followed by periods. So if you're giving the me a metric symbol in the middle of, of a description, it wouldn't be followed by a period. But if it ends um, an element, for example, at the end of the 300 field, if it ends in CM, you still would give that period because you're giving the period that, to tell that this is the end of the field, not because it's an abbreviation. There is an alternative in RDA to record dimensions in the system of measure preferred by the agency, and LC policy says, for at least for the test, was that they were going to continue to use inches for disks, um, but otherwise follow the RDA um, instruction as written. Uh, again, the change for illustrating uh, illust illustrations is that we're going to spell all these words out. 
again, another opportunity for us to make a lot of typos, and I think we're going to hopefully develop systems that enable us to use checkboxes that, that will say um, that will say which ones we have. Um, and so um, that's the big change here. Here's just some examples of extent to show you what a full extent would look like. Um, just a lot more spelling. Um, I know I've gotten questions in the past on the second example about whether we have to use the British spelling or the English spelling. So you can see that there, the spelling of the word color um, is not required to be one way or the other. You can see in the first, second example, we're using the British spelling. In the third example, we're using the, the American spelling. Either one is okay. Um, one change from A's here too is that we no longer can say chiefly ill in the 300 field. There's no way to express that in RDA in extent. They didn't provide an option for that. So if you need to bring that out, you'd have to give that out in a note. Um, and note that um, things like stereo and mono are no longer considered abbreviations. They're just words. And notice in the last example, because of the way the elements are recorded in RDA, we end up reversing sound and color in the order that we record them. Okay, and the very last thing I want to talk about um, in description is series. Um, and we have some changes in the way series numbering is recorded in RDA. So we're told in AACR2 to go to Appendix B for abbreviations and numerals in Appendix C. And so we end up with, um, in ACR2, a volume that says volume 68 spelled out being abbreviated as V period 68. Now I'm talking about the series statement here, not the access point. There isn't a change in the way we give the 8XX series access points. So you would still use abbreviations there, but in the description you would spell out the form and you would still change the spelled out number to 68 based on RDA instructions. Um, in Again, the second example, we would spell out the word number, not abbreviate it. Um, this example on this slide, we would spell out the word book. And in this second example, Roman numerals will not be changed to Arabic numerals. And this last slide illustrates that when you have a found abbreviation on the source, you would record that found abbreviation as, as you see it. So number as abbreviated gets recorded as NO. Um, Fünfte Bond gets recorded as Fünfte Bond spelled out, um, not, um, here's a case where the BD does change to spelled out form, a bond. And one other change has to do with ISSNs for main series, sub-series. In ACR2, we only, were, we were told if we had both, you only record the ISSN of the sub-series. And in fact, in MARC, you had no way to record both of them. The subfield X was not repeatable in that 490 field. Um, MARC has been changed in AACR because of RDA. Um, so we are now told to record both of them. So here's a change. I don't think it affects too many records, but it, um, I was a, not, it didn't take me too long to find one um, in my, my collection that I could use as an example. So this is a change in recording ISSNs. A subfield X is repeatable, and you, record, you can record, and, and you, you do record both. Okay, now finally, to wrap up, um, and before I take questions, I did want to quickly show you some new Mark 21 bibliographic fields that I use to record RDA attributes of works and expressions. Some are new fields, and some are new subfields. So we've already had the 046 for special coded dates, but they defined a number of new subfields for beginning date created, ending date created, beginning date of date valid, um, and so on. And this is because of RDA 6.4, that is the element date of work, which is date of work is a core element, meaning you must record it, when needed to differentiate a work from another work with the same title or from the name of person, family, or corporate body. So here's an example of that. These are, um, this is an actual RDA record from the test. Um, and it's a, it's a film called Omerta, and it's, there are other films called Omerta, so the date is used in the access point to differentiate it. But because you need that date to differentiate it, the, it is also a core element, and that element is recorded in mark field 046 in the subfield K. Here's a case where we have two 046s because there are two different films on this one DVD. So we've got two works that we're describing, so we end up with two 046s for the date of creation of each of the works. We also have a couple of new fields, um, 380 for form of work. 
Again, it's a core element when needed to differentiate a work from another work with the same title. So um, if you have two works with the same title that are motion pictures, or one work that's a motion picture in a television program, you need to record the form of work. And that goes into field 380 in MARC. There's also another field, 381, which is used for other distinguishing characteristics of work or expression. And these are the things that aren't form of work but are needed in the access point. So they're things you add in parentheses in the access point. And they don't make a lot of sense when you look at them individually like this, but they will when you look at a record. So here's that same record that we saw before for Omerta. Um, we need, to, we, there are other motion pictures named Omerta, so we record the form of work in the 380 field, and then it's also used in the access point, um, naming the work. Here's um, an interesting case in the test, it's, it's only core, these, the 380 is, these elements are only core when needed to differentiate works from each other. But you can record them otherwise. And here, um, I think this is the Pennsylvania Historical Society. They've recorded for their state documents a form of work heading taken from LCSH, even though it's not needed in an access point to differentiate this particular work from any other. But I suppose um, they decided to test this out. Here's an example showing the other um, distinguishing information. So this is motion picture, two motion pictures named Harlow, both in the same year. And so we have to add something else to distinguish them. In this case, we add the director's name. So um, you can see the access point gets complicated. Motion picture, 1965, Douglas. The motion picture part gets recorded in the 380. The, the 1965 goes into the 046. And then the Douglas go, is the other distinguishing characteristic. It um, doesn't make a lot of sense sitting there by itself, but a computer could put, possibly put all these bits together and form the access point. And then finally, for music, we've got a few new fields for medium of performance, designation of a numeric designation, and key. And here's just an example showing that, again, these are core elements if needed to distinguish musical works from each other. And so we have a sonata by Telemann, um, and in this case it's for viola da gamba continuo and the work the numeric designation and the key is recorded, and all of those are recorded in separate um, fields as well. Okay, so that is a very quick presentation covering a lot of stuff, and I'm going to go see if I can find the questions now and see if there are any questions. Okay, I need to undock this so I can look at them. And let's see. Um, the question, there's one question that's a typo. Is, it's a typo that there's a filing indicator of zero in the serial title proper example showing dot, 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 annual report. And actually the answer to that is no, it's not a typo. Um, you don't count um, leading you, you count up to the first word, and the dot, dot, dots count, do not count as words. I verified this. I know that that is correctly coded as a zero. Those dot, dot, dots do not get counted. Um, let's see. I notice on an example of an RDA record that was at the beginning of the presentation that minutes was still abbreviated. Yes. Um, yes, indeed. Um, measurements of, of length are still going to be abbreviated. That is the one thing um, in RDA where they are continuing. They are, they, JSC discussed this and they felt that those are really well known by users, that those are the particular abbreviations that are known. And so they are keeping um, things like um, a measurement of length of, uh, of uh, uh, um, duration. Um, for, so we will still record minutes as MIN. Um, let's see, the next question is, when is OCLC planning to completely migrate to RDA? Um, you know, I think that OCLC is never going to completely migrate to ODA. I don't, I don't know. I think, first of all, we're waiting to hear the results of the national test. So if the Library of Congress and the other national libraries um, decide to implement o RDA, I think it's very likely that the the standard and OCLC for new records is likely to be RDA, but I don't know that they could ever forbid any libraries from inputting records according to whatever cataloging description um, they wanted to. 
because we already get records that are for, from other descriptive standards from all over the world. So I don't think they're ever going to completely migrate to RDA. What they've done is they've made it possible to, to catalog with RDA by adding all the new MARC elements. Um, and as far as whether um, the U.S. community as a whole adopts RDA, I think we're all kind of waiting to see what the national libraries say. Um, the next question is, in the pages I was spelling out for RDA, I had something like IX comma 253 pages. And the question was whether there should be pages after IX. And I, th I don't think so. I, you know, I don't have the time to go back to the RDA rule, but I've given you that on the slide and we could both look it up. But I think it's correct. Um, and certainly a number of people have looked this over, and well, we, st we still find errors, but, but um, I I'm pretty certain that that is correct. Um, question about if the date on the book is a Roman numeral, is that transcribed in Roman numerals? I'm not sure the answer to that. Um, I, think, I think it's allowed, um, and then I think, you would I think you were allowed to record it as found, but I, I don't remember what the specific rule is in RDA, but you could go to that instruction in RDA, and um, I'm, sh I'm pretty sure that it's covered there, or trans transcription of, of numbers in general, there are rules for that. Um, so I can't, off the cuff of my head, I can't answer that question. Um, let's see. I had microform in 337 media, but microfiche in 338 carrier. Yes, is that correct? I believe so. The media is the gener is more a general media um, type is a more general type of media used. So it's a, it's a microform material is the medium, but the specific carrier that that microform appears on is either microfiche or microfilm or micro opaque. And so th those are the actual carriers. I think that's right. Um, next question is why is other title information for cartographic materials included in 245 and not as a note? I think I, I can't answer, I can't tell you why the, J, I'm, why the JSC decided that. I'm sure they discussed the issue. I think probably because the titles for cartographic, for maps can often be one word titles and the cartographic community has decided that it's really helpful to identify the, the place of coverage in the um, title and statement of responsibility area. And so for that reason they felt that it was still important to continue to bracket that information. Um, but um, if there's anybody with cart who's a cartography cataloger, um, they might know. Um, let's see. Are we still monographic accompanying material example um, with this, like a, a monograph with a CD-ROM? Are we still using subfield E in 300? Yes, I believe so. Um, I don't have an example of that, um, but I think there are some examples showing that in the RDA test records. Um, and I think there's also the option to record multiple 300s um, instead if, if when you have a resource that's made up of multiple um, types. So you can either, whether you treat it as a company material or as, a, um, for example, a kit that is made up of different types of material, yeah, I think you have the option, just like you do in ACR2, to treat it um, either way. Um, let's see. So did anyone test these new standards with users? Good question. Well, I think you'd have to ask if any of the people that are doing the RDA test that actually created um, RDA test records, and I, I don't know the answer to that. There is an RDA discussion list, and I think that would be a really good question to post on there and to see if anybody has thought about ways to test them with users. I, I'm sure that they've, I know in terms of um, many libraries have consulted with public services staff as to the new RDA fields and elements and how they want those to display in their OPACs, but actually testing with users, I doubt. <laughs> um, so, so I, I, I think it's a. I think I would ask that question on the RDA list. I think I would love to read the answers to see if any of the testers have done that. Now, for those of you that are not familiar with the test, there were um, the three national libraries in the U.S. and the library of, and and 25 other testers that were participating in the test. And um, and I'm seeing a response from Anna Kristan at the Library of Congress that part of the test was to show the test records to users. Um, so um, we'll see if 
you know, what, what, what the testers report. And maybe on the, the Library of Congress testing page, we'll have some information about that um, as part of their evaluation of the test. Uh, let's see. Um, I think I'm going to have to turn it over. I think that it's about noon, and I'm supposed to turn this over um, to Diane to do some follow-up, uh, just final um, comments. So um, that's all the questions I can take. I want to really thank all of you for attending. I hope this has been really useful. Um, again, remind you that there's a, a much more complete presentation with my notes as well that you can get um, off of um, my homepage. And you'll be getting that home page in the copy of this presentation when you get that on Friday. So I'm going to turn it over to Diane now. Thank you, Adam, very much for helping us understand the differences between AACR2 and RDA. Um, Adam will be presenting a second webinar next Wednesday at the same time to focus on the changes in access points. And here is the list of um, the upcoming webinars in our RDA series. And um, you may know there is special pricing if you register for more than one of these. We also um, hope you will check out the ELECT's website to uh, look for uh, announcements of other events, registration information, and uh, upcoming webinars. Attendees will all receive an online evaluation form from ELECT's. Please respond. We value your input and your suggestions. Before we sign off, I would like to thank Jackie Samples for providing technical support for today's webinar. Um, we appreciate your attendance today, especially those of you with difficult weather conditions. Thanks to all of you for joining us, um, and we look forward to sharing other topics with you in the future. And if there are any le lingering questions that you submitted and have not been answered, we will um, have Adam answer them for you um, uh, in a little while. So thank you again, and have a good day. <laughs>